All right. Should, should we get going, Amy? Yeah, yeah, let's get started. So I'm, I'm Nathan Schneider, um, and, and who are you? <laughs> uh, I am Amy Zang. <laughs> Do... uh, yeah. <laughs> Welcome, y'all. Uh, Amy, say something about yourself. Okay, hi. Um, so I am a, an assistant professor at uh, University of Washington in computer science. Um, I'll be starting there this fall, so it's a new position for me. Um, and I do research in social computing and human computer interaction. I do a lot of um, building and designing of new forms of uh, social communication, whether it's like new forms of email or chat or um, uh, online discussion of any form, um, as well as online collaboration. So happy to be here. Awesome. And um, I'm a, a professor of media studies at the University of Colorado Boulder, um, where I run the Media Enterprise Design Lab. And, um, and I'll, I'll, the way this we'll, we'll do this session is um, we're going to kind of do it initially in two chunks where um, I'm going to share a, a present on a project um, and, we're, and do an exercise. And then Amy's going to present on a project and do an exercise. And then we'll have um, hopefully plenty of time after both of those for uh, an open conversation. Uh, but these, these uh, projects we're presenting on are uh, uh, different and distinct, but they're connected as being part of a common conversation around the, the meta governance project. And, um, and so uh, hopefully you'll see those linkages and, and, um, and, and we're really looking forward to this kind of conversation between projects, between code bases in very much in progress and, uh, and eager to see how they you know, bounce off of you and how you bounce off of them. Um, I'm, I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, and uh, so, uh, and just uh, walk you through a little bit of where we are. Um, many of you hopefully uh, attended the previous session where Josh Tan um, described some of the vision of the Meta Governance Project. Um, a, a kind of super absurdly ambitious uh, uh, kind of effort to design and, and propose and build uh, a governance layer for the internet across platforms and, and so forth. Um, that's a hard, big project that we're trying to make progress on. Um, but in the meantime, you know, folks get impatient and I, I, I'm certainly uh, uh, one of those folks. Um, and uh, part of this you know, part of the urgency, you know, one reminder of the urgency, at least, of this challenge of creating, you know, making it easier to do good governance online came um, after, you know, the early onset of COVID. I have an aunt who is, uh, um, uh, what works on, lately has been working on death, has been, you know, does a lot of hospice work, is, is you know, involved in helping people uh, come to the end of their lives. And suddenly under the coronavirus, she was part of a group of people involved in similar stuff. And they kind of rapidly came together and started building something um, about how to like, kind of how to guides for how to handle kind of death under social distancing conditions, right? Really urgent, essential, like powerful work. And she kind of called me up in the middle of this and was like, this is weird. I've never been in this kind of group. Now, this is probably familiar to many of you, right? Uh, but for her, this was new, a group where like, there's no organization, there's no company, there's no structure, but we're just like all doing something. And uh, we're all working on something together really rapidly um, in Google Docs, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. That's called peer production. Here's some, she's an anthropologist. So I sent her a bunch of anthropological literature. And then I said, but watch out, probably one guy is going to uh, uh, show up and start slowly like accumulating power and then kind of running the whole thing. And um, that's called a benevolent dictator. And he's probably really nice. And, you know, and then a couple of weeks later, like she reported back, that's exactly what happened. She was really frustrated. She kind of backed out of the group, but. Um, but didn't, you know, and didn't know what to do about that. Um, it turns out that this pattern is really, really persistent in, um, in our online networks. And I've done some research on it. And, and in the research, I, I end up calling it implicit feudalism. And this goes, um, you know, all the way back to our, um, to our earliest networks, like you're seeing here, uh, a, a login for an admin um, system for a bulletin board system, pre-internet. 
Um, and that term sysop is, you know, the benevolent dictator. That's the person with all the control. Um, and, um, and, you know, I compare this, for instance, to, um, uh, to like the, my mother's garden club, which, you know, is a pretty conventional familiar entity type of entity. And, you know, it's like got very good constitutions, constitutional structures, there are elections, um, there's like oversight, you know, and it's just a club for people who like to get together and like peer educate on, on gardening. Um, yet this offline institution strikes, strikes me as like having a form of sophistication and rigor about its structure that is often very much missing from our peer production spaces. You know, many of us, you know, might have uh, encountered at some time this famous essay, The Tyranny of Structurelessness, and we kind of nod and recognize uh, this in our online networks, the way in which this kind of, this kind of feudalism emerges um, when there isn't something in, uh, 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 there isn't something um, instead. And, and I think a lot of this comes back to the tooling we have. You know, if, if you've ever run a large mailing list or a Facebook group or something, all the tools are set up not for the kinds of things that my mother's garden club does, um, but, um, but for um, the sysop with absolute power to um, eliminate speech and uh, to remove people. Um, you know, these very kind of like authoritarian acts are, the, are what the tools are designed for. Um, and, uh, and so the Meta Governance Project is an effort to try to Im improve the tooling um, and, and enable us to have better tools uh, to implement things like elections and juries and all sorts of things. Um, but short of that, you know, working on this project, I got impatient hearing stories like my aunt's and, um, uh, you know, started wondering, is there a way that natural language in the short term could help us solve some of these problems? And one example that I found really helpful in a group that I run is the Contributor Covenant, um, which, you know, I added it to a 500 person email list. This is a code of conduct uh, developed by Coralyn Nada Emke. Um, that's adopted in many open source projects. It's a very simple document, and um, excuse me, and it um, and just having a few rules, um, you know, on a couple a couple pages worth of text, um, enabled our group to solve a problem that had been vexing us uh, for for months. So it made me think, okay, a little natural language can go a long way. But maybe one size fits all for every group doesn't make sense. So I thought about Creative Commons, you know, where if you're going to create a, um, uh, if you're going to share your work, right, you have some options. Um, there's not very many options, but you have a few, right? And many of you have probably gone through this, but, you know, just a few little buttons and then you have your license. Boom. Um, so uh, the, um, the attempt that I made to try to introduce this, um, uh, this uh, uh, intervention is uh, called Community Rule, uh, a governance toolkit for great communities. It's an attempt to uh, make it as easy as possible for groups to adopt a governance rule to short circuit um, uh, uh, that tyranny of structureless as quickly, structurelessness as quickly as possible and get on with the good stuff that they want to do, but be prepared uh, for the kind of uh, uh, difficult decisions that may lie ahead. Um, and I think of this in terms of a stack, you know, governance is one layer, often groups have their platform, they have their code of conduct, they have their, they've thought about their, you know, software licensing often a lot in software communities, but the governance layer is often really missing. It's not made explicit. Um, in contrast, someone using community rule, for instance, um, might do what, what um, the contributor covenant itself did. Um, uh, Coralyn uh, adopt, used community rule to create this very short document. Um, and, you know, it says community rule derived at the bottom. And this is the governance.md document in their GitHub repository alongside the code of conduct and the contributing and the readme and the license, right? Um, and actually her new project, Ethical Source, um, creating an alternative definition to the standard open source projects um, is, has um, uh, uh, now embraced the recognition that in order for a community to be welcoming and just, a software community, it should publish clear rules for project governance as well as adopting uh, a code of conduct. 
So, you know, what I'm trying to do here is just like a simple natural language version that might get us some of the way toward solving this like uh, this uh, benevolent or this um, uh, implicit feudalism problem that we have um, in, in uh, many kinds of communities. Now, in addition to software communities, uh, we're uh, this summer working with uh, COVID-19 mutual aid groups, uh, many of which are kind of in the process of shifting from their early phase of excitement and energy and enthusiasm to, oh gosh, this is gonna go on for months, maybe years. Um, we need to dig in for the long haul and we need the structures to enable us to do that. So we've been doing workshops with, um, with mutual aid groups around the United States, uh, particularly here in Colorado, uh, to, uh, uh, to help them use this tool. Uh, now the tool has, I'll take you on a little bit of a tour. Uh, the tool uh, allows you to start in two places. One um, is to start from scratch. Um, it uh, opens up a blank uh, questionnaire essentially with a bunch of questions uh, uh, out, uh, laid out in categories. Um, you don't have to answer every question. If you don't answer the question, it, it just um, uh, disappears. You should answer the question in complete sentences because uh, the questions disappear. So if I say radical exchange workshop, uh, and then I say we are um, an oligarchy um, uh, controlled by Amy and Nathan, uh, and then I press preview, uh, this is what comes up. Uh, all, all the other things disappear. Uh, but there's lots of other good stuff that I'm missing. Um, another thing I can do there is publish um, or export. So export will uh, uh, turn this into a markdown file that you can pop into your Git uh, repo. Um, publish will publish the rule to the library, which um, is a collection of user generated um, rules. And the collection is still rather small, but already I'm seeing users learn from each other. And I've been learning from them as well. For instance, um, uh, one user took, um, started from a template. We have a set of templates here, a fairly small set um, that people can start from. And um, they started from the benevolent dictator template and um, changed it to make it a temporary benevolent dictator. So there's a requirement that after some, you know, after a certain process uh, 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 takes place, the benevolent dictator transfers their authority to a, a, a small board. Um, and uh, so the, the, it was really fun to see a user first uh, uh, submit this temporary benevolent dictator and then see other users start to adopt that logic in their own, um, in their own rules. And then I added that logic to our core benevolent dictator template because it just seemed like such a sensible idea. But there's lots of others. Um, the goal here is not to steer people toward one kind of thing or another. Um, you know, democracy of a certain sort is not always the best uh, thing. There are lots of different ways of, um, of doing accountable participatory communities. And this um, list is probably an incomplete, but a, a, a one effort to uh, capture some of the major patterns that we tend to see. Um, and, uh, and so that's the other starting point. You can start with a template and edit it from there. And of course, all of this is a work in progress. Um, uh, I've got a, a, an active um, set of, of issues in the GitLab, as you can see, of things that uh, we're working on and that we need to improve on. And, um, and I'm uh, certainly very open to community participation in, in that process and in building this very simple tool. Um, but in the meantime, I'd like to get you uh, 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 playing around with it, if you're willing to give it a shot. Um, I'd like to invite you to, um, to go to communityrule.info, uh, where you are. Uh, if, you, if for some reason that doesn't work, uh, that multitasking doesn't work, maybe you could, um, uh, you, you know, you could just do a pen and paper exercise and think about the rule that your group might um, have, but but start by thinking about a group that you're that you're in, especially one that doesn't have an explicit set of agreements or or rules or a constitution yet. Maybe it's a a project you're working on with some friends, or or maybe it's even your family or um, some other some other uh, assortment of people uh, that you're part of. 
uh, and and um, uh, and that doesn't have a kind of explicit um, uh, rule set yet. And then I'd like to invite you to try to describe that group. Um, probably start with the create um, mode, uh, so you have kind of a clean slate. And um, and if if you can't think of a group that makes sense for you, maybe. Um, imagine one that you'd really like to be part of, but I'd really encourage you to do some some self ethnography um, and try to describe something that you experience regularly, but you haven't put down into words. Um, and it's okay if that rule, you know, the, if those practices don't quite meet, you know, your values yet. Um, uh, just I think there's a real value in getting them uh, down and and um, uh, and and and, and uh, you know, having them explicit in some form. Uh, so for the next 10 minutes or so, I'd like to invite you to, um, to, to take some time to do that, um, uh, to get started. That might not be enough time to, to go all the way through, but um, take some time to, um, uh, to, to start and to start describing and reflecting on, on what you do already. And um, we'll uh, we'll just uh, set a timer. We're at about ten um, till the hour, and maybe we'll come back just a few minutes before, you know, maybe at um, uh, a minute or two before the hour, and just start hearing from each other. Okay. Um, so let's let's try to come back together, um, and um, I, I hope I hope you've gotten uh, somewhere in this in this time and uh, had some at least uh, experience uh, chance to have some experience playing around here. Um, did anyone learn anything about the the group they're in in trying to um, make its its practice explicit? Feel free to uh, unmute yourself. Not having personal knowledge about the community members makes it uh, quite hard to understand their intentions. Okay. Uh, does anybody, would anyone I just like- for me, the, the, yeah, the difficulty was thinking about like, how should people get removed at this point? Because our organization, like I want to create uh, kinds of community tools so that you can mark people who are trolling or violating the code of conduct. And then after a certain number of violations, it would go automatically. But right now those tools don't exist. So then it always does end up somebody being kind of the bad guy or the two thirds vote is what you guys um, put in for the duocracy as a default. And none of that really followed how I'm thinking about it. Like we've been thinking about how people establish a reputation over time a little bit like how Slashdot works. And then you would know, you know, you would have the ability to, you could participate, but you're always gonna be moderated down to, you know, so that your voice doesn't show up, but you can keep talking to yourself and um, yeah so it's just the, it really brought to the fore how the the collaboration tools just are not anywhere near what my thinking is about how these things should be run and we have a lot of work to do man <laughs> yeah absolutely and, and one of the challenges is that we tend to follow we do what the tools allow us to do and um, you know one of the goals with this space and this tool in lieu of having better tools is just to create a separate space where people can think what it, what would actually make sense for this community right forget about the tools that we actually have and then if it requires an admin being powerful having temp, you know infinite responsibility in the platform but being accountable for implementing the the rules that the group has agreed on um, then maybe that would change behavior even though the tool set isn't really e equipped for it um, maybe one more reflection uh, before we move on to Amy. Yeah, if nobody is yeah, talking, we, it's... Please, Caroline, okay. 
Hi, yeah, I'm Caroline. I'm going to be super, super quick. Um, I'm, I'm zooming in from Berlin and I, I think it's great what you've been setting up. Um, for me, it was kind of implicit when you're saying what basic rights does this rule, you know, it's like a, you're doing ki kind of a staggering ladder is what I understand, but not coming, let's say, from a development field. Mm -hmm. I think it would be super interesting to bring this into a political realm, um, but making more explicit what the rule actually is and also taking into account that people are um, not one person or one set of behavior every single time, but behavior changes within the context of which I'm behaving in and also acquires maybe, or um, I'm able to, to change over time. So how is that taken into account? Yeah, the, I, the, to, to me, that's like for a group to, to figure out and, and, to, um, uh, and to try to describe uh, here. You know, one of the key uh, hopes for me, and I, I'm excited to see some of you have already been adding, uh, publishing the rules that you're, that you're exploring, um, uh, is, that, is to have groups uh, devise their own strategies for addressing challenges like this uh, and share them with each other. And learn from each other. And you know, as I mentioned, I've already seen a little bit of that happen. Um, but my hope is is that this is really as open a space as possible for groups to um, identify what the, what is most appropriate for for themselves and to share those those strategies with each other. Um, you know, again, this is uh, very new and very rudimentary. Um, but I really appreciate you all um, taking some time to play with it. We'll have. Um, uh, it, again, in the later section, we'll come back to this and we'll kind of blend our conversations together. But now I'd like to turn it over to Amy to introduce uh, Policy Kit. Thank you all again so much for, for playing with me. Yeah, so thanks again, Nate. Um, I think you'll see that the project that I'll share with you that I've been working on um, is really kind of nicely in dialogue with uh, community rule. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to share a presentation. So can you all see that? Yeah. Um, so, and I can no longer see the chat now, I see. So if you have a question, you, if you could please raise your hand or if Nate could tell me, because I also can't see everyone's video. <laughs> Happy to. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so Nate has been talking about um, communities devising roles using natural language. And um, as a computer scientist, I've been thinking about how communities um, could be devising roles in code. And um, um, it's interesting because I got involved with the Medigov kind of project. I was working separately on thinking about online communities because that's kind of more my realm of research, um, kind of how to support uh, communities on Reddit, communities on um, Wikipedia, um, on Twitter, et cetera, and thinking about how the design of those communities um, can actually lead to better outcomes, such as more pro-social uh, interactions. And part of that, obviously, a big part of that is governance of the community. And then that's kind of let me, uh, led me down this path um, and designing tools for supporting governance, which is what I'll be talking about. Um, so some of this, I think, will sound a little bit similar in terms of the motivation. Uh, but you know, thinking, turning now towards kind of the software that's embedded in these online communities. So not necessarily the sort of the, the rules that they may have articulated via natural language, but actually just like the underlying structure of these communities, they um, almost all, I would say, uh, have this particular technical structure, uh, which is that it's role-based um, and the roles um, for pretty much all of these include administrators, moderators, and regular users. Administrators are the ones who perhaps created the community or have been granted admin roles by another admin. They can then appoint moderators who um, can kind of help with governance tasks. And then everyone else is just kind of a regular user who does not have these privileges. And you see this pattern on uh, lots of places, anywhere from a Facebook group on a large platform to like just mailing list software that's open source. Um, but as we know, there's a lot of different ways to govern a community. So, you know, what is it about this particular pattern 
that it's just like proliferated across across all the tools we use today um, and has come to be embedded in basically all the tools. Um, and, and, you know, actually it's not just like discussion kind of group software, it's, it's all these kinds of collaborative tools and any kind of tool that involve, involves multiple people actually kind of has a similar pattern or similar property. So, um, you know, your Google Docs um, uh, document, your Zoom room, like the one we're currently in, um, if you create a calendar event, if you add a file to Dropbox or a folder, if you, do, if you create a GitHub repo, you have an owner role who has absolute pr privileges. Uh, you have some special users with uh, particular write permissions, perhaps. Um, or execute permissions. Um, and then you have kind of users who have more like read or general participation permissions. So this kind of pattern is in a lot of places. Um, I think Nate has a nice paper he mentioned about implicit feudalism that kind of talks about how this perhaps emerged from a, a Unix uh, file permission system um, way back when. And so basically the, the pattern that uh, you see through all these is this idea of describing governance as a set of permissions. Uh, sometimes those permissions get bundled into uh, a group of permissions called roles, um, and those are then granted to users. So then um, the way the governance is carried out technically is a user tries to or wants to do a particular action. The code then checks an existing permission table, sees whether that user has permission to do that action. If so, in this case, uh, action X is approved. So that's the entire kind of way the governance works. Uh, and then in terms of kind of modifying the governance over time, so having different users have different permissions, uh, that's basically like an owner role or a creator or admin role who has permission to um, do the action, which is changing other people's roles or permissions. Um, and, and fundamentally, this, this model is very simplistic. Um, it cannot describe many of the governance systems that are out there that distribute power in more kind of non-binary ways. So either you have the permission or not. It's, you know, um, maybe, maybe you have a, a policy where sometimes you have a permission and other times you don't have permission. That's not possible in these tools. Um, or non-role-based ways, so not necessarily tied to the particular user. So things like uh, democratic Thing, uh, democratic uh, governance where a uh, decision is decided amongst a group of people. Um, so if you're a community, you're unfortunately using one of these pieces of software, which almost everyone is, um, and you want something that isn't, uh, that's outside of the permissions model, um, you have to do it in kind of a manual ad hoc way. So for instance, if you used community rule and you instituted a jury system in your community, you would have to like manually do the steps every time to carry out that jury. And of course, this is kind of cumbersome to do. It can be error prone. Uh, sometimes it relies on everyone kind of knowing what the rules are in order to abide by them. So this has issues. Um, alternatively, you could try and build some one-off software to help carry out the governance. So sometimes you'll see this on Wikipedia. They have these little bots that help clean up things and help out with governance on Reddit. Sometimes you'll see this as well. It'll like remind people about particular rules. Um, but these are pretty much also just one off, um, hard to maintain, hard to know about. Um, and they're also rarely integrated into the platform. So there's still some kind of manual work that needs to be done. So an example of this is like Facebook polls, for instance, or uh, Twitter polls. Um, so you can have uh, an election uh, using a poll on your uh, Facebook group but to actually, like an election to be a moderator, uh, but then to actually turn that person into a moderator, uh, an, an existing moderator and admin would have to step in and um, then manually grant the winner of the election that, um, that particular permission. So, so the outcome is not tied to that election. So given all these difficulties, it's kind of no wonder that communities, for the most part, just kind of follow the default provided by their tool software. Um, and this is unfortunate because we have decades of research that shows that uh, for some communities, um, this kind of autocratic, top-down, oligarchic model may not actually be good for the community. And um, Eleanor Ostrom is sort of um, this uh, Nobel Peace Prize 
or sorry, not Truffle Coop, Nobel Prize winner on uh, who does research on governing the commons, and she has a number of um, design guidelines for having um, good governance. And um, a lot of those things are not met by these kinds of permissions models. So uh, my research was thinking about, okay, so what if community software allowed communities to come up with uh, whatever governance they actually wanted instead of assuming um, everyone gets this kind of default autocratic model? And what if this was actually embedded into the software itself so users didn't have to like do all this work to be able to carry it out? So for that, we need to design a model that can be expressive enough and rich enough to describe more than just permissions and uh, users having permissions. And um, that's what I worked on um, and I'm still working on this tool called the Policy Kit. Um, it's a software tool that empowers users to be able to self-author a broad range of governance models that they can then enact and carry out on their community of choice. And I'll explain a little bit about that in more detail. Um, just a little bit of the name comes from this uh, policy kit slash poll kit tool that is in Unix operating systems to kind of um, do this kind of scripting behavior over permissions um, for files in Unix. So the way the model works is instead of articulating permissions, like I mentioned before, policy kit allows anyone to write short scripts in code um, which we call, you know, procedures or policies to govern any action. So this is a lot more expressive because it's, it's just code, right? Um, so you can write almost any kind of governance into that code. Uh, so using policy kit, so user A would like to do X. Um, now we are going to check all the policies that do govern X. And if there's a policy that governs X, we're going to run that policy um, because this code, it can just run and execute. And then the action gets approved. If, uh, the policy stated that it passed. And then in terms of being able to modify that governance over time, um, we also have actions that involve trying to create a new policy or edit a policy or delete a policy, et cetera. And so these um, are also actions that a user may do. And these actions can also be governed by additional policies. And I'll describe that as a little meta-ish. Um, so here's some examples. I'm, t I'm saying these in kind of natural language, but in the system, you would be writing these as code. So uh, actions, once again, there are these one-off events that any user can propose or multiple users can propose. So as an example, you know, Sarah would like to post the message hi to the announcements channel on Slack, um, or Jane would like to introduce a new policy. And then a policy that governs that action so, you know, an action is kind of this one-time event. Policies are these things that are continually running, checking for new actions that come in, see whether or not they pass, um, and then just continue to do that. So uh, a policy for um, posting to this uh, channel would be like any post to the announcements channel must first be approved by a moderator. Um, an example of a policy governing um, introducing a new policy would be to add a new policy, it must first be voted in by a majority vote. And um, I just want to clarify that um, we have two different types of actions and two different types of policies. And this is me trying to separate kind of um, logically and semantically um, the, the kinds of policies that relate to everyday governance, just like things that are happening, people posting, entering, leaving the community, et cetera, and things that involve modifying the governance itself. So the specific actions of introducing a new policy, um, editing a policy, deleting a policy. Um, and then we have specifically constitution policies that govern those kinds of actions. Please tell me if anything is confusing or needs um, explanation further. Okay, so that's kind of the underlying model. Uh, but then, you know, how do you get policy key working in your community, right? So we want this to be able to work for people in communities using software that's available on the web. So policy kit includes uh, these four components. So first we have a software library written in Python that helps you with writing policies. Uh, we also have a series of platform integrations. So connections to Slack, to Reddit, to GitHub, um, to Facebook, um, et cetera, where users can, um, do, are they're doing things in their, you know, Slack, in their Reddit, you know, not using our tool but they're still being governed by policy kit. And we can do that via platform integrations using uh, the API of that platform. 
Uh, we also have a website for uh, people to be able to propose actions that they don't kind of do in their um, everyday kind of actions. So things like um, proposing a policy, for instance, would be something that you would do on our website. And there we have things like code editors to help uh, people with writing policies. Uh, and then finally, I mentioned there's that kind of long running program that's sitting on a server, in this case, our server. Um, but you know, you could, you could set up your own instance and run your own server um, where this is kind of looping through. It's a program that's looping through all the policies of your community and continually checking them against actions that come up. So kind of a high level diagram, uh, just trying to show kind of how these different pieces work together. So let's start with A. Um, you're on a platform, you're on Slack, for instance, and you are trying to uh, post a message. So you, you, try, you attempt to post the message. So then uh, what happens is if that community is connected to PolicyKit, uh, PolicyKit is sitting on a server, it's listening to all the actions that are happening on Slack. That's the platform action listener. Um, and then every time it hears an action, it sends it over to the policy engine, which is that long running process where all actions are then checked against any existing policies and these are written in code so they're just kind of running and then if something gets passed then um, the policy engine goes ahead and executes that action on the platform so you know as a user on your end um, if that if you have the ability to do that action you don't even necessarily know like all the stuff that's happening on policy kit you would just see your message get posted um, and then moving over to b um, I mentioned constitution actions, right? So things people can do to alter the governance, uh, their, their existing governance. So you go to our website um, and there you can uh, propose new constitution actions such as creating a new policy. Um, they also, those actions also get sent to the policy engine. If it passes, then it goes ahead and saves into our database and um, joins kind of the loop of existing policies. Um, uh, yeah, and then C, just to mention also like to, to be able to write policies, you need some sort of code editor and we provide that on our website. Okay, so now for some details on how to actually write a policy, right? So it's not just, um, we decided to make it more structured as opposed to just writing any code because I think that can be difficult for people. Um, it's uh, written in Python. Um, you, you would write your policy in Python. Um, you have access to um, objects from our data model and our helper methods. Um, this part is probably going to be a little bit um, harder to follow for those who are not programmers, but um, I'll try to explain each step kind of in natural language. Um, and as a programmer, you also have access, you can call any web APIs, external APIs, which is, which is um, helpful to kind of um, do less work. So here's an example of a script written to um, instantiate a jury in um, a community. So there's basically six steps, six functions that you have to implement. Um, the first is a filter function, which says um, whether or not this action that's coming in is relevant to the policy that you're writing. So in this case, I'm saying, you know, if someone is trying to rename this channel in Slack, then yes, it is uh, adequate or like uh, it's, it's in scope for this policy. Then the next function is initialize. This is just for any code that you have to kind of get the policy up and running. In the case of a jury, uh, you would want to select the members of the jury. So here we have some code to randomly go through the members, pick three in this case, and um, those are the jury members to determine um, the outcome of this, this particular action. Uh, there's a check function which then, uh, this is kind of the, the main part of the policy. This is continually running to be able to determine whether or not that action can pass. So in the case of a jury, we have written in code that if uh, two out of the three jury members have voted yes, we want it to pass. If two days have passed and sort of nothing, uh, no, that hasn't happened yet, um, then we'll just go ahead and fail it. And then we have a, a notify function. So this is, um, Anytime you want to go and tell um, community members about something, you use our notify function. So in this case, we want to alert the jury members to vote on um, this policy. Um, so they can do that all within Slack. They don't have to like go to policy kit to go vote on it, which would be cumbersome. So instead we send a message to them in Slack. We tell them, 
hey, please deliberate amongst yourself. Um, and then, you know, click the uh, upvote emoji or the downvote uh, emoji in order to vote once you're done. Um, Policy Kit listens to these events and then collects those votes as they come in. Um, and then finally, we have uh, places for you to write in code what happens um, if the policy passes and what happens if the policy fails. So in the jury case, it passed. We just can call execute on the action um, since we know what the action is. So it'll itself know to go and rename that channel. If it fails, we just do nothing. So the, the rename did not happen. So this kind of describes the, the workflow of how those functions actually get called as things happen. So, uh, you know, a, uh, given, uh, taking our prior example, um, someone tries to rename a channel, that's a new action that comes into the policy engine. We check to see whether, it, uh, whether any policies match it. So for every policy, we do the filter. If it passes that, we run initialize. At that point, we check to see whether we can just go ahead and pass that, uh, that action. If it passes, good, go. If not, we run the fail code. Um, then we run notify to then tell uh, jury members in this case to vote. And then we go through this loop where we're just continually like checking. Have two out of three voted yet? Have two, or three vo two out of three voted yes yet? Um, round, around and around until at some point in the code, there is this kind of like timeout. So in this case, it said after two days, we're no longer going to do this. Um, and we can go ahead and fail. So that's kind of logically how um, it's running. I wanted to, uh, I kind of stated this in my uh, description earlier, but this is kind of like a nice visual of how everything is happening. Um, and it describes the details of how to actually deeply integrate this into a platform because we want to make this something that um, feels seamless and really usable for someone. Um, they don't have to go to policy kit all the time. They can be totally in Slack and just um, be doing their thing and governance things are happening. So here's that rename example again. So I'm in Slack. I'm trying to rename something um, on, on policy kit. I'm listening and um, I've got that action. I run through the different policies. Um, I find one that fits. I run that policy. Um, if something actually has passed, uh, sorry, if something um, has actually failed, then I need to go and revert what actually happened on Slack. So this is like, um, you know, because Slack itself also has its own governance. So we have to actually supersede um, Slack's governance. And so we do that by um, listening for events and uh, reverting them if um, policy kits governance says it cannot happen uh, or cannot happen yet. Um, I also mentioned earlier that we listen for votes on uh, via kind of this upvote downvote. Uh, you can create other types of uh, ways of voting, um, but in our Slack implementation, this is how you do it. Um, and yeah, I think that's basically it. Uh, on the top, I have a kind of um, little screenshot. So to install policy kit into your system, you just have to like have an admin click a button on our website and it's uh, running and working. Um, just a little screenshot of the policy kit website. So here you can do things like propose any actions. Um, you can see the, uh, the current policies that exist for uh, community. So in this case, um, we have a community policy that is a majority rule. Um, so this is kind of like the uh, software uh, constitution of your community. Um, and you can see the recent actions that have passed or failed or that are pending, etc. Uh, and then here's a little screenshot at the bottom of like the code editor. So that's kind of my overview of policy kit. Um, there's a lot that we still want to do with it. It's still kind of a, um, a prototype tool and we're hoping to get it um, functional for communities to be able to, to use full time. Um, and so the immediate next steps for us are um, improving the authoring experience, making that easier to do, um, turning into something that non-programmers can do. Um, so that's um, a big goal of ours, eventually to move away from programming. Um, we also want to do field studies with real communities and we're trying to integrate with more platforms. So it's just kind of like writing those API connections um, to different, different platforms. Um, and I think one of the things I'm most excited about is sort of like, as we have communities that are using policy kit, what things can we do? Um, and Nathan's kind of talked about this a little bit with like community role, but like 
being able to share or fork these scripts between communities, I think um, is a really cool mechanism. Um, being able to run experiments on communities, do self experiments, monitor how policies are doing over time, um, that would be cool. Um, eventually adding features into the tool to help communities with actually um, designing governance and good governance, uh, because I think it's very easy to write really, really bad scripts that totally destroy your community. Um, so we want to kind of help communities with setting this up, maybe get them started with like some starter kits, kind of like uh, the templates and community role, uh, where you could just click a button and say, you know, I want the um, direct democracy version of policy kit. Um, so yeah, uh, definitely reach out if you have more questions or interested in the tool. So I wanted to move to the exercise. Um, yeah, so this is my first time trying to uh, run this exercise. I think, um, right, so right now policy kit is a tool that can be expressed via programming. And I know that not everyone here is a programmer. So I was thinking that maybe we could just do like a thinking exercise where people can talk a little bit or to themselves about um, maybe the policy that they thought of um, with um, the prior exercise and think about what parts of that policy are automatable versus not automatable and require human input. Um, because policy kit kind of just automates all the infrastructural parts of the policy. Um, and there's this kind of hook in to then go to users or go to people when you um, need them because so much of governance um, involves people, right? Um, so, you know, something, so to kind of give an example, like something like be kind um, is not really something that can be automatable. Um, and that is kind of something that would not make sense to describe in a policy kit policy. Um, although I, we do have this idea of kind of like natural language documents that you can add to and that are governed by policy kit for these kinds of um, kind of just um, human expression rules. Um, but you know, something like all posts without these swear words, for instance, can pass. That's 100% autom automatable. You can describe that entirely via code um, using policy kit. Um, something that is kind of part code, part uh, human input, like the jury example. Um, also this example, like all posts with swear words must first be approved by a random member of the community. That's something that you could very easily write in policy kit and then have a check, uh, in, in, have a notify step to then go talk to um, a person. So I thought we could maybe stop for, I don't know how much time, how much time did I spend? Um, <laughs> five, 10 minutes maybe, just to kind of reflect on this and um, think about whether there are parts of the policies that you've thought of that can actually be automatable and then we'll come back and discuss. And here I've kind of put out the example, the jury example that I had before. May I ask a question? Yes. Yes. Uh, have you given any thought about what you're doing in relation to uh, the Chinese social credit score system and how, uh, yeah, the foundation of uh, what you're building would be able to be implemented in that kind of world governance uh, system? Um, so the Chinese social credit system is, I would describe as a particular type of governance. Um, it is um, a form of like a market-based or merit meritocratic uh, governance where different individuals accrue credit in particular areas. Um, so, you know, you could create a meritocracy in policy kit. Um, yeah. I actually have an example uh, further down of uh, how we implemented a meritocratic system. This is just a very simple example where like you gain credit as you post more in Slack and as you post more, um, you can do more actions uh, to other members. So that's kind of like a very basic meritocratic system. Um, so I think the point of policy kit is that it should be able to describe like as many types of governance systems as possible. And that's kind of like one example of one. I've, I've also got an implementation question. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I asked it in chat. Uh, if you wanted to implement something like a judicial decision where it was supposed to reference precedent or interpret a constitution or so, so it's not just that, a, a, you know, under certain conditions, a person 
I, I'm wondering how you would implement that. Would you have like kind of a referee that's job is to evaluate that? And how would the referee, yeah. Do you have any advice there? Yeah, yeah, you could definitely do something like that. So I think, um, you know, already on the website, we're collecting, you know, these prior actions that have passed or not passed. So it's almost kind of like a case law, if you will. Um, and you could definitely, um, in policy kit, create a role um, or, you know, have, have people who um, go back and look at prior cases and then make decisions based on those cases. Um, I think the going back and looking at cases and making decisions, I think that's probably not something you want to automate because um, a lot of these things are can be somewhat subjective, contextual, difficult to describe in programming. Um, but that's something you could like, you know, assign to like a referee task. Yeah, so I guess I'm, I wonder uh, how you would, just as a practical matter, specify the difference between you're making an arbitrary decision about the outcome of a case versus you're making a justified documented decision where the documentation has to pass certain uh, kinds of review or something. Yeah, so something like um, instituting a review process where other people are then checking your actions. So the, the review process is something that we could write into code as well, right? So this is just like the infrastructural bit about like, you're the referee, you get an action um, um, in, in code, um, or that, that's all described in code, then you kind of like, in your mind, you're doing these things, and then maybe you're filling out a piece of documentation, then policy kit kicks back in, it collects that documentation and then sends it to the review panel, perhaps. And then they um, would not encode, but you know, to themselves are checking that uh, and then maybe signaling back to policy kit that they approve or do not approve. So I'm envisioning something like that probably. Would it be able to uh, extend the two day period for the juries uh, for offline transactions of sorts? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, so, so this is the thing with writing things in code, right? Um, it, you, if you want to have edge cases, you also have to kind of um, specify how that would work in the code itself. Um, and I think this is where I was talking about with like, a lot of times when you're writing these policies, you realize later like, oh, I should have also added this piece of code or, oh, I should have also added this condition. Um, and I think this is kind of like part of improving policies over time. So I can imagine a piece of code here that says like, um, you know, if the jury isn't done deliberating after two days, they can um, make this kind of mark and then policy kit will register that mark and know to then extend the deadline for another two days. Okay. I have a question. Thank you very much for the presentation. You were just mentioning in terms of um, quantity, how much people are documenting when you're saying the person who's writing a lot in the Slack, maybe that gets different rights than another person that is not writing so much. Did I understand that right? Um, because we have a kind of, this to me, like an imbalance here in Germany, if we look at digital um, participation processes where one group of people actually has a time to write a lot, but it doesn't mean that the quality of the writing actually is improving the decision-making process. Oh, totally, totally. Um, so that was not an example of like a good policy, <laughs> to, make, to be clear. This is just an example of an example of a, of a kind of meritocracy. So you who creates this policy for your community can decide what actions accrue points, right? Um, in, in, in a point-based system. So this is just describing what a point-based system would be like. And, you know, you could say, for instance, uh, the people who uh, get the most, like, votes or something, um, or the most kudos or something, um, gets, accrues more points, something like a Stack Overflow uh, governance style model. Um, yeah, so, so I don't want to say that this is like a policy that you should implement. <coughs> A question. Um, I, I've just posted a, um, a pad where where I just shared a, a policy that I schemed up. Um, I invite others to share their policies there too, and we can create a little library if you're playing around with one. Uh, help me think through this a little bit. Um, also, I see a question from Kevin about people injecting malicious code. 
Yeah, so this is definitely um, a potential issue. So we are doing a lot right now to try and improve the security of the system. So there's different types of security issues, right? So one is uh, a, a malicious user who is trying to take down policy kit um, and they can uh, inject things into their policy to do things like, uh, you know, use all our memory, like, you know, um, destroy our database, et cetera. Um, and so for now, we're just kind of um, adding um, things in the code and in our code to try, try and check for those things. So restricting kind of some of the things you can do um, uh, as you're writing scripts and making it more of a sandbox environment. Um, did someone have a question? Uh, yes, me. Oh, sorry, um, I thought I heard, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I had a question about, so the, the, what's the process of like setting up the, the system where, I guess, when, when is the, the moment where you stop being able as a community creator or like administrator? When is the point where you let PolicyKit handle the new policies that will be enabled? Because I, I assume you have to first set up a couple so that at least people can suggest new policies. So it, it kind of self manages it has to self manage itself, I guess. Yeah. So, so it, it, sorry. Yeah, go, go ahead. Um, um, yeah, th there is sort of like a, an initial starter kit that you can uh, just, when you instantiate policy kit for the first time, even if you haven't done anything, uh, we, we try to make a starter kit that was basically like, everything runs as normal and um, the, the community has the ability to create policies from there. And then uh, slowly over time, you can kind of build up more and more policies. Um, and that's kind of the initial uh, state that we have come up with. Uh, I mentioned earlier that you could have other kinds of starter kits um, where if your community, you're like, let's try this like totally different governance and let's just turn that on. Um, uh, and also a, a creator of a new community can start policy kit from the very beginning and say, these are the policies I want. Um, and I'm just gonna have a community like that. So, so all these different models are possible. Um, you know, I'm very interested in the kind of governance where people can kind of self-create policies and build on policies and kind of grow over time their governance. Um, but you could use policy kit to create a benevolent dictatorship and just rule by dictator. Like that is something you could do in policy kit too. I guess my question was also about the, um, so you have to implement kind of like a, a policy to decide what's the rule to change the policies? At, at, yes. at which point does it like a, yeah. It's so, kind so, of a self-referential process there. Is, it, is, there, is there a point where the human has to step in and like decide or is, is yeah, that so itself? That's kind of in the constitution policy step. So when you create, a pol when you uh, instantiate policy kit for the first time, we install an initial constitution policy for you because you, mm -hmm. you need one in order to know how to create policies. And the one that we instantiate is just like a majority rule one. Um, uh, you, and I imagine there are a lot of ones that could make sense and you would be able to pick which one you want. And then from there, you can kind of create policies and that sort of thing, yeah. So if you want to change the mechanism to, to so if you want to change this mechanism from majority rule to, let's say, a, a jury mm -hmm. uh, or something like that, you would have to vote the majority rule to change that policy in the first place. Yes, exactly, okay. yes. Have you given any thought about securing the, the processes with quantum computing? With, uh, what do you say? Com quantum, something com computing. quantum computing? Um, I think that that's probably not really relevant here. Um, for thinking yeah. about security, we have, so I was mentioning, so kind of making the coding environment more of a sandbox where you can't, um, hurt other, hurt our system, hurt other communities, um, uh, um, find out private information about other communities. Um, there's also other types of attacks that we thought of that are interesting. Um, there's the bureaucracy attack, which is that you make really, really complicated code that, I don't know, gives you power or like shuts down the community. And uh, people don't kind of read the code carefully enough in order to protect against that attack. Um, you know, people can also do this in natural language. You know, we see this a lot with, um, you know, laws today. So um, it's not unique to code, but I think it's probably even harder um, to fight against in code. So uh, that's still kind of a, an open question for us in terms of uh, what, how to deal with that. Yeah. 
do you have a documentation of the the code history like can you map it to see how complex it gets and also how you can actually lean it up again yes yeah, so you would be able to on the website see uh kind of the his the current state of policies written in code and um the like history of those policies over time that would be something we would build into the system um, because i think it would be super interesting to have the social study with it you know what does it do the, to the communities like if you implement it maybe you have the possibility to have a human documenting actually the other side of um of the implementation yeah that would be very very cool um one thing i thought of was um to just have some basic monitoring on the site so you could see you know, this policy was invoked like five times in the last week, um, you know, 60% of the time actions failed for these members versus these members. Um, and so you can kind of get a sense of like, is this policy even being used? Um, is it, uh, you know, very restrictive? Is it very permissive? Is it doing kind of the right thing that we want? Um, that would be really cool to be able to kind of audit. Um, and, uh, but th these are all kind of like dreams I have about the system, haven't quite built that yet, but yeah. But in theory, you can use the system to restrict transactions if you uh, implement it with blockchain, yeah? Um, so yeah, I've thought about a blockchain underpinning policy kit. Um, I think it hasn't really come up yet for us because we're not, we're, we're kind of dealing with like Facebook communities or Reddit communities and these, these kinds of um, things where the actions people are doing are um, not so high stakes as like money being transferred back and forth, um, where um, there are high incentives to try and game the system or accrue power. Um, and I think, and so, you know, given these lower stake settings, you know, we just have our own database and we have a server that we run all of these things. Um, and of course we release the code so other people can do the same, but people are welcome to use our hosted system. Um, that's probably not secure enough in the case of um, money transactions where you know, I, the, the server owner, would have access to all this data uh, and be able to you know, steal people's money. Um, so in, in the future, you could imagine a version of this where we're not backed by a database, but by a blockchain system. Um, and um, that's also like potential future work. I think it, it could be interesting in terms of um, implementing this on the blockchain, but um, yeah, I just haven't done it yet. Um, I, I've been, um, you know, chat, chatting a little bit here with, um, with some participants and, and been thinking about something that's really been, uh, that I've been thinking about a lot lately. Um, and I'd be curious about your thoughts on, on Amy is, is the kind of culture layer, right? We're focused on the rule layer, you know, and on the policies and on the, these kinds of structures and the things you can write in code. Um, but I've also been thinking, you know, I, I've been trying to figure out like in building community rule, how can I remind people continuously that um, this is not the only layer, right? This is not the only part of what you need to do. And um, you know, one thing I, I've been talking to some designers who who uh, who who have this you know I have a kind of different visual imagination than the one I've been using. But I'm just curious about how you think about and whether in your experiments you've kind of run up against the the limits of what you can program and and what you want to and how to nudge users also to uh, think about and and practice things other than than the things that can be encoded in rules. Because those are really, um, you know, often a healthy community is really not healthy just because of its rules, but because of its relationships and culture. Yeah, so social norms are incredibly important for a community. Um, there's been research, however, that um, social norms, um, especially in these really large communities like uh, Reddit, subreddits, for instance, um, people don't really know the norms of the community. It's, 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 it can often be very transient when people are coming in and out and um, people have, uh, the moderators of some of these communities have developed tools to be able to try and nudge people, alert people, remind people about norms. Um, and 
you know, sometimes they build bots to do that. Sometimes the moderators are actually just going in there and like replying to people being like, actually, you should try and be more like this or something like that. Um, so this, this act is kind of like training people in the norms and keeping people up to date about norms, I think, is something that policy kit could actually help quite a lot with. Um, so you could very easily write policies such as like when you try to write a post and the post gets uh, rejected, that policy kit goes and then sends a message to that person to say why their message got rejected. This is actually a really important thing for, for people. Uh, there have been studies that shown that this is important, but you know, this is not really possible in a lot of communities today, actually. Um, also, you could do things like um, uh, whenever someone starts a new thread on Reddit, for instance, post to the top of the thread the norms of the community. Just like really simple signaling things like that. Easily automatable um, and could easily be done with policy kit. Um, so I'm not sure how we're doing on time. Um, this a, goes until 12 minutes. Please. Okay, then I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen. How do I do that? <laughs> okay, well, I figure out how to do that. Um, uh, why don't we move to kind of discussing? And I don't know if you had a prompt that you wanted to start off with, Nathan? No, well, we've already got some questions coming in and right. um, I'd love to just invite people to um, uh, to step into the conversation, I think as much as possible, if we can, if we can just step back and st step up and step back. So make sure that, um, you know, if, if a lot of male voices have been speaking, for instance, or other dynamics like that, you know, um, let's make space for that to change. Um, but, uh, but if people just want to unmute themselves and step in, I think we have a small enough group that we can, we can do that. If you'd like to be put on stack to speak next and you don't want to just barge in uh, just let us know in the chat and I'll, I'll call on you does that sound good okay um see there's uh there's some questions here graham is asking where can we go to check what policies have been implemented if we want to try it out oh is this for policy kit i yeah i believe so yeah. um yeah, for policy kit. It, it's it's not quite ready yet I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. We're, 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 I'm actively, I'm act, I mean, it's just me really right now. Uh, I'm actively building it um, and we've got some bugs. Uh, it's probably mostly implemented for Slack at this point. Uh, also the code editing environment is not great right now. Like we wanna add like debugging tools and, and that sort of thing. Um, so that's gonna take a little bit of time, but I think if you're interested in trying it out, please send me an email so then I can just let you know the, the minute uh, we're ready. And of course we also would love to have pilot users. Awesome. See, Grace is asking, is saying, you know, we've been talking about culture creating tools as opposed to rule creating tools. Um, and uh, when I think of culture creating tools, I mean, things like emojis, things like um, you know, the banner on the top of a Facebook page or the, the channel names on Slack that, that Amy's talking about. I mean, all of these can be signifiers uh, in, um, in the context of, of, uh, of an online platform or an online community. And, um, and already communities really try to, and platforms really try to create lots of tools for, um, for communities to kind of create their space and create their uh, their culture, and I'd argue that you know, in a lot of cases, you know, people do a really good job at at building, you know, a certain kind of culture in a certain kind of group. You know, different subreddits or different Facebook groups each have often very distinct kind of sets of cultures and norms, um, and you know, we're in a sense kind of trying to build on on that. You know, I'd argue pretty pretty robust uh, layer. I would argue the opposite. I would argue that most of the communities fail even, you know, if you even look at like, oh, you know, like sustainable communities and, you know, DAOs, like everybody forks. It's like, oh, well, we don't agree with the policy and we just, you know, fork you. And then um, on the online Reddits and Slacks and whatever, the dominant internet culture is divisive. 
And actually the tools have created divisiveness and the emojis maybe do something, but I would argue that the communities that you're talking about that have distinct cultures actually do have these benevolent dictators and moderators. And that's certainly been my experience is that if you're a benevolent moderator, you can create that. And you know, if you don't have someone like that, things go downhill really rapidly. And um, we haven't put a lot of emphasis on the tools of collaboration that, you know, like you look at the Inspiral Network. I mean, they have a huge body of knowledge, but how often do people call them before they fork? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, not even before they fork, like we're creating a new community, let's bring Inspiral in, let's bring so-and-so in, and, I, and then let's create Let's take some of the things that Inspiral has developed or, you know, any of these, you know, um, circling practices or there's a lot of these nonviolent communications and let's create an app that is embedded in our chat platform so that it's not like on top of it or hopeful that somebody will come along and be good at it. I would say that's the biggest gap in governance um, when it comes in particular to, to things that are commons. Um, and to expanding beyond Dunbar's number is to have those things actually built into your chat so that your community gets stronger automatically, not because you were, you know, lucky enough to have a great person leading it. That, yeah, that's kind of. And that that kind of embeddedness is the kind of experience we're trying to move toward with the with the broader MediGov work. Um, uh, something that is embeddable in many kinds of platforms. Um, one thing I'd also add that I think is really interesting you pointed to in, in highlighting the fork language is that, you know, a, a project that Seth um, uh, Frey and I, who Seth was the moderator with Josh's panel earlier, was, um, was is we're looking, going back to that old Albert O. Hirschman exit and voice distinction and, um, you know, recognizing the way in which so much of the action that people can take in online communities is an exit action. Fork the, the project, fork the group, leave the group. Um, uh, and, and you know, one of our kind of underlying, the, the questions we're trying to explore is what would change if there was a richer palette of voice options available to people? Would that create more cohesion, more, more as Hirschman said, loyalty? Um, within groups and and more willingness to build common culture if people know that they're going to have a voice in what what becomes of it. Yeah, I would add to that to say that I, I do think that there's a lot of learning to be done still about um, governance transitions and sort of the life cycle of communities and what kind of governance makes sense at the start of a community when you're small or when you're large and you're old or uh, any sort of configuration of those. Um, and, um, and I think in some of these cases, we're at a point now where we have communities that are older and larger, and this exit option is no longer quite as viable as it was uh, when that community was smaller. So, you know, it's just not that easy to start a new um, community if um, all the people that you engage with are in the other community. Um, and it's not as easy to uh, leave a community if you've invested quite a lot into that community, for instance. And so we're saying, okay, maybe at some point, you know, maybe to start out, moderators and admins kind of got us to a good place, uh, but at some point maybe it makes sense to move to something that is more democratic for instance, to give people more voice. Um, and, and, you know, with the earlier examples people have been make, making about like Python community and Wikipedia community, um, that, that, that kind of shifted in that direction. Um, and these are communities that are, you know, years and years old, um, again. So I think, you know, there's, there's a lot to learn there about that. Yeah. And I would say even further that the problems that we're facing are problems at very, very large scale. So the ability to solve at very, very large scale um, is becoming critical to humanity. So there's uh, that. Joe has, has one more comment. Hi, everybody. Uh, Amy, I'm, I'm really interested in this kind of work, and I've, I've done a bit of it myself. Do you know uh, Jonathan Edwards' programming language work, like uh, transcript, chorus, um, subtext? Do you know what I'm talking about? No, but I would love to learn more. Okay. He, he, he's done a bunch of social programming tools, and, and I did one, um, uh, like, a, like social programming languages. 
languages for making social apps. Um, and uh, I'm very interested in this space, and there's obviously some overlap with policy kit. And, um, and I feel like actually what policy kit does is a really weird slice that might not be the right slice. Like, if you think about Reddit, you think about the community points, the little badges that appear next to, or Facebook groups, you think about the little badges that appear next to Facebook group posts now, like little hand, I'm a new member, a uh, little star, I was a founding member or whatever, this kind of stuff. Um, you think about um, uh, UI that like the branches in different directions for different people. Um, it, it, it seems to me like there's a lot of policy that's actually embedded in the UX. Um, Absolutely. And yeah. so you're kind of limited by doing this slice, you're limiting to this kind of yes or no space, which I think is in almost all of these landscapes, not really the decisive factor. It doesn't shape um, status. It doesn't shape discoverability of different kinds of actions. It doesn't shape um, the potential to match make with other people, like to form groups, like to form juries or whatever. Um, uh, yeah. to find other people with like uh, proposals and so on. So uh, in, in a way, I, I'm not sure that Policy Kit is capable of building the kinds of, um, uh, e even under the, the title of governance, the things that you would really want to do on these platforms. Yeah, and, and I think this is an issue of kind of implementation and, and feasibility. Right, so um, currently it's not really possible to alter UI elements of some of these platforms because they don't expose them via their platform API. And specifically, we wanted to come up with an underlying software architecture that could work with a lot of different platforms. Um, and we've, we found that, you know, the APIs of like Discourse, Discord, Reddit, you know, all these different communities um, can support the integration of something like policy kit. Now, if we wanted to build something to actually alter the UI and to do more UX type things on top of these platforms, um, it would involve a different architecture, probably something like browser plugins or something to be able to do that, which, you know, those don't work in mobile. So, you know, the, the, there's all kind of clunkiness that comes with trying to do that. Um, you could also build your own, you know, community software, but then you have to convince people to go and use your community software when they've been using, you know, whatever for so long. So I think there's, there's a lot of challenges in terms of like getting this to a state where it's actually practical for real communities. And we took the approach of doing something that would be easiest for a current community on a, on a platform to like kind of easily integrate policy kit and still kind of be in their native UI and native like language. Um, Cyprian had a question and, and I think maybe we'll wrap up with this one uh, if that's okay. Uh, but uh, Cyprian, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, uh, uh, perhaps it feels a little bit off topic, uh, what I'm wondering about. Um, I mean, I'm old enough to have experienced the uh, uh, transition from the analog to digital era. Uh, but, and I understand that uh, this policy kit that you're building uh, has the focus of internet communities, online communities, and uh, the governance of those. Uh, but when we're talking about culture, I mean, culture is not a thing that is uh, restricted to the online world, uh, either if it's uh, culture in general generated top down or bottom up uh, in uh, certain uh, socio sociological uh, uh, theories, uh, uh, independent of them, uh, what I'm thinking of mostly is that uh, what you're actually describing with this policy kit is uh, real life uh, governance in real time. And we're talking about wealth distribution issues, yeah? Because if you're gonna use these kinds of programming languages to actually make a difference in the world, uh, you're actually creating something that uh, can uh, either uh, uh, suppress or acknowledge uh, economic transactions. Uh, at least in my view, that, that, that's what I'm associating, uh, the framework that you're uh, talking about and describing. Um, of course, governance per se on online communities uh, I don't know if that's an uh, effortless uh, 
uh, evolvement that is taking place, but I would very much uh, appreciate to uh, touch base with you in the future about these issues as uh, uh, I, I do uh, make some uh, uh, yeah, connections to other, uh, other uh, societal issues uh, per se. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, I would love to also keep in touch um, and think about um, the impact of such a tool on broader society. I think that there are numerous potential impacts, some good, some bad. Um, it's hard to say right now. So, yeah, of course. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much for being part of this discussion. And um, uh, we, we really appreciate the, the feedback and the questions. And please um, continue to be in touch. You know, we're both very Googleable and, and, um, and uh, happy to hear from you. So um, thank you all again. Um, if you want to uh, applaud each other, uh, please unmute and, and we'll, this is one of our Medigov um, practices that Seth imposes on us is the, the awkward Zoom applause. So let's end with that. Um, unmute on the count of three uh, and, and applaud. Three, two, one, <laughs> go. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Thanks, all so guys. Much. Like yeah. we're all together. All right, be well. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye.